Okay, my brother. So, um, my first question to you, what is the meaning of the Black Lives Matter? Black Lives Matter means that we exist, we're here, we have voices, you know, but also the fact of that we have rights that we demand, not only civil rights, but human rights. We demand to be respected and honored, but it's also a calling of empowerment for the people. Empower, you know, empowerment economically, you know, spiritually, you know, um, emotionally, and many other, many other facets that's involved in that, so that way the people understand who they are, that they are now, that they exist, other than what the narrative of the system tells us. So do you think from the time the Black Lives Matter created, we as African people see a changes here in America? All we've gotten was low hanging fruit. I'm gonna be very real about this. All we got was low hanging fruit. But this is why many organizations separate themselves, like Black Lives Matter and so many others, separate ourselves from the head of corporation. Because once you become incorporated, guess what? You no longer have the same platform. Because now you have people telling you, if you want to receive these funds, this is what you need to speak on, and this is the actions you take. So we decided, you know what, we're going to stay grassroots, we're going to move forward. As you can see in Brooklyn, the movement has grown. This is the epicenter of the movement in the country right now for a reason, because we stay true to the platform and true to the people. And the thing is that we don't just go for low-hanging fruit. This right here, this is symbolism. But this ain't, this is not the final works. This legislation going through right now, legislation that we even going to push to get introduced, that's going to fully hold these officers accountable. But not only them, but also the judges who hide behind immunity. And we're also going to go after the elected officials who receive money from the racist PBA, the SBA, uh, COBA, and even the ones who voted for the four new jails that's going to be filled with black bodies. Okay, so um, African people was in slavery for like 400 years and more. Yeah. From the time we came out from slavery, we see racism as being global. Yeah. How do you think we should trample racism here in America and across the diaspora? Because it has been a disease that spread across the globe. Exactly. We, we went through, we've been going through two pandemics. The pandemic recently of COVID, but also the pandemic that we've had for a lifetime that's been racism, oppression, you know, you know system, the systemic oppression of our people and of their minds and of their beliefs. What needs to happen, we need to start taking cues from many of our people, from many of our our family members and people across the diaspora who have been rising up. When they told when they told us, oh, you know, they're breaking stores on Fifth Avenue. So your store windows are worth more than our lives and our bodies? No. That's the belief of capitalism. Capitalism is not our belief because capitalism started with the investment of our bodies to be enslaved. We were the first capital of this system. So we're gonna tell them no more. We're gonna shut it all down. If they don't, if they don't want to hear by our demands, Wall Street will get shut down, DC will get shut down, every single state will get shut down, every courthouse will be shut down because enough is enough. Okay, so do you think that the system has played a major role within the project with the black on black crime? I'm gonna be really, very, 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 very blunt about this. Black and black crime does not exist. That is a racist narrative that the system used to have our people split against their own people, to have the media demonize and criminalize our people, yeah. to have white allies who once were aligned with us to stay away from us because they didn't want to get categorized. Because you don't hear nobody out there talking about white on white crime. Because if they want to talk about black on black crime, I'll talk about white on everyone crime. But they don't have that conversation because they privilege feel uncomfortable. Their privilege and their entitlement is not worth more than our life. You know, not worth more than our life. Harmony, come here. You know, not worth more than our life. And people have to understand, we as a people have to stop using that narrative. We have to stop being conditioned by these races. The shackles are taking off our feet and our hands, but they put the shackles in our minds. We have to re-educate ourselves and recondition ourselves from it. Because not only just for us, but for our youth. They have to never fall into the same situations that we're in. In the civil rights era, we had 20 to 30 years of complacency after that. I've had civil rights leaders tell me that they're sorry because after they got their houses, after they got the six figures, they were happy, but they did not continue to fight. This fight is not over. It is not over until we hear what we want, which is our demands, until we get it. Like I said, they always say the revolution will not be televised, but I guarantee it's gonna be felt. My last question to you, so how do you think, like across the diaspora, 
we as African people could come together to fight this fight. One, we need to realize who we are as one people. Even in Jamaica, my family's from Jamaica. It says, out of many, one people. That's not just talking about Jamaica. That's talking about the diaspora and whole because those are, that's the same belief from back then. Matter of fact, when you look throughout the whole, when throughout the whole Afro-Carib, it used to be called one people under the sun. Just because they chopped us off in different ports on ships does not mean that we're not the same people. All the people who, are, who call themselves white identifying, people who are Dominican, people who are Puerto Rican, you're black, your aboriginal ancestry is black. When you look in Asia, when you look, when you look to where they pushed them off to in the outskirts, they're black. Melanin is dark as us, hair as curly as ours. It's a, this is what people need to understand. We have to stop the separation. That's, what, that's the goal of the system. But we're not only going to blame the system, we're going to blame those who look like us, but ain't for us as well too. That the agents of white supremacy. We're going to make sure that we not turn to this whole system, and if they go with it, they go with it as well. Quick message to the young African people in America that who has lack of their history and lack of the um, things that are going on in society. How would you bring them to be aware of everything? When I was in school, they never taught me about black history. I'm going to tell them now what my mother told me. Self-educate yourself as well, too. She brought me books of Malcolm, she brought me books of Martin, Rosa Parks, and she had me self-educate myself. She explained her experiences to me. But not only to the youth, but to the elders. Explain to these youths what you went through. Don't let them think that it was all sugar-coated. Let them understand the ugliness of it, from them spitting on you, from them beating you, from the hoses being put on you, from the dogs being sick on you. Because the same thing is happening now. Prepare them for, the, for what's going on now, so that way they can help fight so it's not going on tomorrow. But also, we're pushing for legislation for African-American history in New York, and hopefully throughout the whole of this country, from ages K to 12, so they can realize who Marcus Garvey was and his teachers, to realize Malcolm X and the fact that he was in this demonized person yep. they try to make us out to be, to know who all our ancestors are, to know the importance of Dutchie Bookman, Toussaint, Dessalinas, all these people that came together as one to take back what is ours, which is our freedom. Any, Any message freedom. you'd like to send to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put a message out there to all the white supremacists and white nationalists real quick. Yes. We're not afraid. We're not afraid. You fight, you hide behind the system like cowards. You hide behind the police like cowards. But if you notice, we've been stepping to the system and we've been pushing it back. Just the other day, I received hate mail and threats of lynching. Wow. I tell them, come out here and try that. Come out here and try that. Because we ain't gonna sit down, like Malcolm X said, we ain't gonna, we, we're not just gonna sit. No, 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 no. He said, you cannot get your liberation by sitting. You gotta come out swinging. And we're ready to swing back. The time is now. This is our time. And we're gonna make sure that we get our liberation. Okay, and there's any, um, you have any social media? Um, what role you play? How people can uh, meet you? All right. you know. Well, I'm the president of Black Lives Matter Brooklyn. Um, I'm also the president of the Brooklyn chapter Cop Watch Patrol Unit. I'm also a city council candidate for the 45th district with the Flatbush East Flatbush. You know, the, the, the mainly the epicenter of Brooklyn, you know. But also you can follow me on social media for Black Lives Matter on Twitter. It is BLM Brooklyn. For myself personally, it's Vote, the number four Beckford. For IG for Black Lives Matter, it is Black Lives Matter BK. Uh, for Facebook, it's Black Lives Matter Brooklyn. And for Facebook, for myself and IG, it's Anthony Beckford, the number four city council. Um, if they want, they can go to my website, anthonybeckford.nationbuilder.com. I just released my Black Equity and Empowerment agenda as well. Too. Wow, thank you so much, my brother. Peace. Definitely.